Hello, people. Thank you for joining again for another segment of the autobiography of Malcolm X. This will be part 36. When we stopped last time, he um, was having a lot of trouble in America and felt like um, the Nation of Islam had it out for him and wanted to execute him or kill him. And um, he finally been convinced to sort of divorce with them and before thinking about what his next or decided about his next steps he was headed to mecca now if you didn't know all that my suggestion is go back to part one just scroll back to part one better yet go back to um father's day 2020 and start with black boy by richard wright the beautiful beautiful wonderful autobiography um here we go the, pil the pilgrimage to Mecca, known as the... So I'm going to be mispronouncing some of these words, I'm sure. So that's just a disclaimer, okay? The pilgrimage to Mecca, known as the Hajj, is a religious obligation that every Orthodox Muslim fulfills, if humbly able, at least once in his or her lifetime. The Holy Quran says it. Pilgrimage to the, Ka to the Kaaba is a duty men owe to God those who are able to make the journey. Allah said, and proclaim the pilgrimage among men. They will come to you on foot and upon each lean camel. They will come from every deep ravine. At, at one or another college or university, usually in the informal gatherings after I had spoken, perhaps a dozen generally white complected people would come up to me identifying themselves as arabian middle eastern or north african muslims who happen to be visiting studying or living in the united states they had said to me that my white indicating statements notwithstanding they felt that i was sincere in considering myself a muslim and they felt that if i ex was exposed to what they called true islam i would understand it and embrace it Automatically, as a follower of Elijah Muhammad, I had bridled whatever this was whenever this was said. Once in a conversation, I broached this with Wallace Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad's son. He said that, yes, certainly a Muslim should seek to learn all that he could about Islam. I had always had a high opinion of Wallace's opinion. Those Orthodox Muslims who I'd met one after another had urged me to meet and talk with a Mr. Muhammad Yusuf Sharabi. He was described to me as an eminent learned Muslim, a University of Cairo ga um, graduate, a University of London PhD, a lecturer on Islam, a United Nations advisor and the author of many books. He was a full professor of the University of Cairo on leave from there to be in New York as a director of the Federation of Islamic Associations in the United States and Canada. Several times driving in that part of town, I had resisted the impulse to drop in on the FIA building, a brownstone at one Riverside Drive. Then one day, Dr. Sharabi, hope I'm saying that right, and I were introduced by a newspaperman. He was cordial. He said that he followed me in the press. I said that I'd been told of him, and we talked for about 15, 20 minutes. We both had to leave to make appointments we had. When, we, when he dropped on me something whose logic never would go out of my head, he said, no man has believed perfectly until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. I'll say that again. No man has believed perfectly until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. Then there was my sister Ella herself. I couldn't get over what she'd done. I've said before that this was a strong, big, black, Georgia-born woman. Her domineering ways had gotten her put out of the Nation of Islam's Boston, Boston Mosque 11. They took her back. Then she left on her own. Ella had started studying under Boston Orthodox Muslims. Then she found a school where Arabic was taught. She couldn't speak it. She hired teachers. I'm sorry. Then she founded a school where Arabic was taught. She couldn't speak it. She hired teachers who did. That's Ella. She deals in real estate, and she was saving up to make the pilgrimage. 
Nearly all night, we talked in her living room. She told me that there was no question about it. It was more important that I go. I thought about Ella the whole flight back to New York. A strong woman. She had broken the spirits of three husbands. More driving and dynamic than all of them combined. She had played a very significant role in my life. No other woman was strong enough to point me in any, in any direction. I pointed women in directions. I had brought Ella into Islam and now she was financing me to Mecca. So sometimes, um, yeah. Okay, I'm just not gonna be commenting on his uh, positions toward women right now. I'm just gonna read his, read his autobiography. Hush up now, hush up. Allah always gives you signs when you are with him that he is with you. When I applied for a visa to Mecca at the Saudi Arabian consulate, the Saudi Arabian ambassador told me that no Muslim converted in America could have a visa for the Hajj pilgrimage without a signed approval from Dr. Mahoud Sarabi. But that was only the beginning of the sign from Allah. When I telephoned Dr. Sharabi, he registered in astonishment. I was just going to get in touch with you, he said. By all means, come right over. When I got to his office, office Dr. Sharabi handed me the signed letter approving me to make the Hajj to Mecca and then a book and then a book, it was Eternal Message of Muhammad by Abd al-Rahman Azam. The author had just sent a copy of the book to be given to Dr. Sharabi, he said, and he explained that this author was an Egyptian-born Saudi citizen, an international statesman, and one of the closest advisors of Prince Faisal, the ruler of Arabia. He has followed you in the press very closely, he said. It's hard for me to believe. Dr. Sharabi gave me the telephone number of his son, Muhammad Sharabi, a student in Cairo, and also the mem a member of the author's son. A number, he also gave me the number of the, um, blah, 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 blah. Dr. Sharabi gave me the telephone number of his son, Muhammad Sharabi, a student in Cairo, and also the number of the author's son, Omar Azam, who lived in Jeddah. Your last stop before Mecca is Jeddah. Call them both, by all means, he told me. I left New York quietly, little realizing that I was going to return noisily. Few people were told I was leaving at all. I didn't want some State Department or other roadblocks put in my path at the last minute. Only my wife, Betty, my three girls, and a few close associates came with me to the Kennedy International Airport. When the airline's jet had taken off, my two seat row mates I had in, had a, my two seat row mates, my two seat row mates and I introduced ourselves. Another sign, both were Muslims. One was bound for Cairo as I was, and the other was bound for Jeddah, where I would be in a few days. All the way to Frankfurt, Germany, my seatmates and I talked, or I read the book I'd been given. When we landed in Frankfurt. The brother bound for Jeddah said his warm goodbye to me and the Cairo bound brother. Okay, I read that wrong. When we landed in Frankfurt, the brother bound for Jeddah said his warm goodbye to me and the Cairo bound brother. We had a few hours layover before we would take another plane to Cairo. We decided to go sightseeing in Frankfurt. In the men's room there at the airport, I met the first American abroad who recognized me, a white student from Rhode Island. He kept eyeing me and then coming over, are you X? I laughed and said that I was. I hadn't ever heard of me spoken that way, X, he exclaimed. You can't be, boy, I know no one will believe me when I tell them this. He was attending school, he said, in France. The brother Muslim and I were, stuck, were struck by the cordial hospitality of all the people in Frankfurt. We went into a lot of shops and stores looking for more, looking more than intending to buy anything. We'd walk in any store, every store, and it would be a hello. People who you'd never seen before and knew, you knew that they were strangers and the same cordials was, mm, people who never saw you before and knew you were strangers. I didn't read that right. We went into a lot of shops and stores looking more than intending to buy anything. We'd walk in, any store, every store, and it would be, hello, people who never saw you before 
and knew you were strangers and the same cordial when we left without buying anything. In America, you walk into a store and spend $100 and leave and you're still a stranger to them. Both you and the clerks act as though you're doing each other a favor. Europeans act more human, more humane, whichever is the right word. My brother Muslim, who could speak enough German to get by, would explain that we were Muslims. And I saw something had already, ex I saw something I had already experienced when I looked upon a Muslim, not as a Negro, right in America. I'm gonna read that again. He explained that we were Muslims. And I saw something I had already experienced when I was looked upon as a Muslim and not as a Negro right in America. People seeing you as a Muslim saw you as a human being and they had a different look in their eyes, different talk, everything. In one Frankfurt store, a little shop actually, the storekeeper leaned over his counter to us and waved his hand indicating the German people passing by. This way one day, that way another, he said. My Muslim brother explained to me that what he meant was that the Germans would rise again. Back at the Frankfurt airport, we took a United Arab Airlines back to Cairo. Throngs of people, obviously Muslims, were everywhere, bound, bound on pilgrimage. They were hugging and embracing. They were all sorts of complexions. The whole atmosphere was of warmth and friendliness. The feeling hit me that there really wasn't any color problem here. The effect was as though I had just stepped out of a prison. I had told my brother Muslim friend that I wanted to be a tourist in Cairo for a couple of days before continuing on to Jeddah. He gave me his number and asked me to call him as he wanted to put me with a party of his friends who could speak English and he would be going on the pilgrimage. And who would be going on the pilgrimage too? And they'd be happy to look out for me. So I spent two happy days sightseeing in Cairo. I was impressed by the modern schools, housing developments for the masses, and the highways and industrialization that I saw. I had read and heard that President Nazar's administration had built up one of the most highly industrialized countries on the African continent. I believe that what most surprised me was that in Cairo, automobiles were being manufactured and so were buses. I had a good visit with Dr. Sharabi's son, Mohammed Sharabi, a 19-year-old who was studying economics and political science at Cairo University. He told me that his father's dream was to build a university of Islam in the United States. The friendly people I met there, I was astounded with when they learned that the friendly people I met there, the friendly people I met were astounded when they learned I was a Muslim from America. They included an Egyptian scientist and his wife, also on their way to Mecca for the Hajj, who insisted that I go with them to dinner in a restaurant in a suburb of Cairo. They were an extremely well-informed and intelligent people. Egypt's rising industrialization was one of the reasons why Western powers were so anti-Egypt. It was showing other African countries what they should do, the scientist said. His wife asked me, why are people in the world starving when America has so much surplus food? What do they do, dump it in the ocean? I told her yes, but they put some of it in holds of surplus ships and in subsidized granaries and in refrigerated spaces and let it stay there with a small army of caretakers until it's unfit to eat. Then another army of disposal people get rid of it to make space for the next surplus batch. She looked at me in something like disbelief. Probably she thought I was kidding, but the American taxpayer knows the truth. I didn't go on to tell her that right there in the United States, there are people who are hungry. I telephoned my Muslim friend as he had asked and, and the Hajj party of his friends was waiting for me. I made it a do do do. I made it eight of us. And they included a judge and an official from the ministry of education. They spoke English beautifully and accepted me like a brother. I considered it another one of Allah's signs that whenever I turned, someone was there to help me, to guide me. The literal meaning of Hajj in Arabic is to set out toward a definite objective. In Islamic law, it means to set out for Kaaba, a sacred house, 
to fulfill a pilg your pilgrimage rites. The Cairo airport was where scores of Hajj groups were becoming Marim pilgrims upon entering the state of Iran. I hope I'm saying it right. The assumption of a spiritual and physical state of consecra consecration. Upon advice, I arranged to leave Cairo all of, at Cairo all of my luggage and four cameras and one movie camera. I had brought mm, I had bought in Cairo a small valise just big enough to carry one suit, shirt, pair of underwear sets, and a pair of shoes into Arabia. Driving to the airport with our Hajj group, I began to get nervous knowing that from there in, it was going to be, I was going to be watching others who knew what they were doing and trying to do what they did. Entering the state of Iran, we took our clothes and put on, we took off our clothes and put on two white towels. One, the Izar was folded around the loins. The other, the Rita, was thrown over the neck and shoulders, leaving the right shoulder and arm bare. A pair of simple sandals, the Na'al, left the ankle bones bare. Over the Izar waist wrapper, a money belt was worn, and a bag, something like a woman's big handbag, with a long strap. It was for carrying the passport and other valuable papers, such as the letter I had from Dr. Sharabi. Every one of the thousands at the airport about to leave for Jeddah was dressed this way. You could be a king or a peasant and no one would know. Some powerful personages who were discreetly pointed out to me had on the same thing I had on. Once thus dressed, we all had begun intermittently calling out La Beaka. Let me see if I... La Beaka, La Beaka, here I come, O Lord. The airport sounded with a din of murrim expressing their intention to perform the journey to, her, to Hajj altogether. Plain loads of pilgrims were taken off every few minutes, but the airport was jammed with more of their friends and relatives waiting to see them off. Those not going were, those not going were asking others to pray for them at Mecca. Those not going were asking others to pray for them at Mecca. We were on our plane in the air when I learned for the first time that with the crush, there was not supposed to be, mm, we were on the plane in the air when I learned for the first time that with the crush, there was not supposed to have been space for me, but the strings had been pulled for me and someone had been put off because they didn't want to disappoint an American Muslim. I felt mingled emotions of regret that I had inconvenienced and discomforted whoever was bumped off the plane for me. And with that, an utter humility and gratefulness that I had been paid such an honor and a respect. Packed in the plane were white, black, brown, red, yellow people, blue eyes and blonde hair, and my kinky red hair, all together, brothers, all honoring the same God, Allah, all in turn giving equal honor to each other. From some in our group, the word was spreading from seat to seat that I was a Muslim from America, faces turned, smiling toward me and greeting. A box lunch was passed out and we ate that. The word that the Muslim from America was aboard got up even to the cockpit. The captain of the plane came back to meet me. He was an Egyptian. His complexion was darker than mine. He could have walked in Harlem and no one would have given him a second glance. He was delighted to meet an American Muslim. When he invite, then he invited me to visit the cockpit. I jumped at the chance. The co-pilot was darker than he was. I can't tell you the feeling it gave me. I had never seen a black man flying a jet. That instrument panel, no one could ever know what all those dials meant. Both of the pilots were smiling at me, treating me with the same honor and respect I had received ever since I left America. I stood there looking through the glass at the sky ahead of us. In America, I had ridden in more planes probably than any other Negro, and I had never been invited up into the cockpit. And there I was with two Muslim seatmates, one from Egypt and the other from Arabia, all of us bound for Mecca, with me up in the pilot's cabin. Brother, I knew Allah was with me. I got back to my seat. All the way about an hour's flight, we pilgrims were loudly crying out, Labayaka, Labayaka, the plane landed at Jeddah. It's a seaport town on the Red Sea, 
the arrival or the dis, dis uh, the disembark mm -mm -mm, the arrival or the disembarkation point for all pilgrims who come to Arabia to go to Mecca. Mecca is about 40 miles east inland. The Jeddah airport seemed even more crowded than Cairo's had been. Our party had become another shuffling unit in this shifting mass with every race on earth represented, with every race on earth represented. Each party was making its way toward the long line waiting to go through the customs. Before reaching customs, each Hajj party was assigned um, a mudawaf, who would be responsible for transferring that party from Jeddah to Mecca. Some pilgrims cried, Labayaka. Others, sometimes large groups, were chanted in unison a prayer that I'll translate for you. I submit to no one but thee, O Allah. I submit to no one but thee. Thou hast no partner. All praise and blessings come from thee, and thou art alone in thy kingdom. Thy essence of the prayer is the oneness of God. Only officials were not wearing the, the Ibram garb or the white skull caps, long white night shirt looking gown and the little slippers of the Mudawaf, those who guided each pilgrim party and their helpers. In Arabic, a, a mmm sound before a verb makes a verbal noun. Mudawaf means the one who guides. The pilgrims on the Tawaf, which is the which is the circum circumambulation of the Kaaba in Mecca. I'm not sure about what that is. I was nervous, shuffling in the center of our group, in line waiting to have our passports inspected. I had an apprehensive feeling. Look at what I'm handing them. I'm in the middle of the Muslim world, right at the fountain. I'm handing them an American passport, which signifies the exact occupant. The exact, the exact opposite of what Islam stands for. I was nervous. The judge in our group sensed my strain. He patted my shoulder. Love, humility, and true brother brotherhood was almost a physical feeling where everywhere, I, everywhere I turned. Then our group reached the clerks who examined each passport and suitcase carefully and nodded to the pilgrim to, the pilgrim to move on. I was so nervous that when I turned the key of my bag and it didn't work immediately, I just broke the bag open, fearing that they might think I had something in the bag that I shouldn't have. Then the clerk saw that I was handing him an American passport. He held it. He looked at me and said something in Arabic. My friends around me began to speak rapid Arabic, gesturing and pointing, trying to intercede for me. The judge asked me in English for my letter from Dr. Sharabi. And he thrust it at the clerk who read it. He gave me the letter back protesting. I could tell that an argument was going on about me. I felt like a stupid fool unable to say a word. I couldn't even understand what was being said. But finally, sadly, the judge turned to me. I had to go before the, the Magama Shria, he explained. It was the Muslim high court which examined all possible non-authentic converts to the Islamic region seeking to enter Mecca. It was absolute that no non-Muslim could ever enter Mecca. My friends were going to have to go on to Mecca without me. They seemed stricken with concern for me. And I was, I was stricken. I found the words to tell them, don't worry, I'll be fine. Allah guides me. They said that they would pray hourly in my behalf. The white-garbed Mudawaf was urging them to go on so they could keep schedule in the airport's human crush. With all of us waving goodbye, I watched them go. It was then about three in the morning, a Friday morning. I never had been in such a jammed mass of people, but I never had felt more alone and helpless since I was a baby. Worse, Friday in the Muslim world is rough as a rough counterpart of Sunday in the Christian world. On Friday, all the members of the Muslim community gather to pray together. The event is called um, Yan al Juma. Juma. Ah. The event is called, let me see, Yan al Juma. Ah. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. The day of gathering. It meant that no courts were held on Friday. I would have to wait until Saturday at least.
an official beckoned a young Arab Mudawaf side aide. In broken English, the official explained that I would be taken to a place at the airport. My passport was kept at customs. I wanted to object because it is a traveler's first law never to get separated from your passport. But I didn't. I didn't object. In my wrapped towels and sandals, I followed the aide in his skull cap, long white gown and, skip and slippers. I guess we were quite a sight. People passing us were speaking all sorts of languages. I couldn't speak anybody's language. I was in bad shape. Right outside the airport was a mosque and above the airport was a huge dormitory-like building four tiers high. It was semi-dark not long before dawn and the planes were regularly taken off and landing. Their landing lights sweeping the runways or their wing and tail lights blinking in the sky. Pilgrims from Ghana, Indonesia, Japan, Russia, to mention some, were moving to and from in the dormitory where I was being taken. I don't believe that that motion picture camera ever has filmed a human spectacle more colorful than my eyes took in. We reached the dormitory and began climbing up the fourth top tier, passing members of every race on earth, Chinese, Indonesians, Afghanistanians. Many not yet changed into their garb, still wore their national dress. It was like pages out of the National Geographic magazine. My guide was on the fourth tier. He gestured me into a compartment that contained about 15 people. Most lay curled up on their rugs asleep. I could tell that some were women covered from head to toe. An old Russian Muslim and his wife were not asleep. They stared frankly at me. Two Egyptian Muslims and a Persian roused and also stared as my guide moved us into a corner. With gestures, he indicated that he should demonstrate to me the proper prayer ritual postures. Imagine being a Muslim minister, a leader in Elijah Muhammad's nation of Islam and not knowing the proper rituals. I tried to do what he did. I knew I wasn't doing it right. I could feel the other Muslims' eyes on me. Western ankles won't do what Muslim ankles have done for a lifetime. Asians squat when they sit. Westerners sit upright in chairs. When my guide was down in a posture, I tried everything I could do to get down as he was, but there I was, sticking up. After about an hour, my guide left, indicating that he would return later. I never even thought about sleeping. Watched by the Muslims, I kept practicing my prayer postures. I refused to let myself think of how ridiculous I must have looked to them. After a while, though, I learned a little trick that would let me get down closer to the floor, but after two or three days, my ankle was going to swell. I do think that that is about it. It was a little rough today, y'all, but I was tired. Thank you for joining me for the autobiography of Malcolm X, part 36, and hope to see y'all tomorrow. Take care.